everyone. This is update for October 8, uh, uh, 2022, uh, day 227 of the war and of the date of date. <clears throat> so as I posted uh, on the community board, uh, <coughs> Crimean bridge uh, has been attacked at uh, 6 a.m. Moscow time on October 8. So <laughs> what is clear is it, well, there is not that much clear, let's put it this way. Uh, there are all kind of versions. Some of them are what sort of Russian <coughs> authorities are putting up totally don't make sense. But um, what we can say for now is uh, one of the, um, well, not sections, but one of the lines uh, in one direction has been damaged. So it, as you can see, the, I think three sections has been damaged, well, destroyed, uh, and they need replacement. The other, the, the sort of um, the road in other direction is looks like okay. Uh, then there was some damage to the uh, railroad line here. It's it's very clear that there was uh, quite a bit of burning uh, f uh, from the fuel uh, in this railroad carriages, uh, and it's there is probably from high heat some structural damage. Uh, to the carrying capacity uh, of the of the bridge in that area, uh, hard to say anything. You know, we'll find out. You know, probably Russian side doesn't even know themselves what's going on there. They put a test train that's the, towards the end of the day that drove through it, uh, and um, it successfully passed. Uh, at the same time, they don't allow <clears throat> passage of the like semi-trailer trucks and so and things like that, or actually any trucks with exception of the passenger cars on this other section. Uh, what they started using, they started using uh, uh, ferries uh, to great, ex uh, you know, as soon as this happened. But as we discussed many times before, ferries don't provide uh, the same throughput. It's uh, many, many times smaller than the regular bridge so uh, how it was attacked uh, is still somewhat unclear however there is um, um, there was news about two weeks ago on uh, September 29, uh, 21 uh, when there was this uh, unmanned uh, underwater or uh, vehicle was found near uh, so, uh, Sebastopol, Sebastopol, I guess in in, in English, uh, <coughs> and the, it was found by Russian authorities, and nobody knew what what is that, what's going on, like couldn't make any kind of sense of it, and that news kind of died off uh, at that time because nothing happened. We just found this <coughs> this boat there, uh, and now. Um, Given this whole situation, probably that was sort of maybe even initial attempt to um, to attack the bridge at that time, mm, and now it was apparently more successful. But this is just hypothesis. I'm not saying <coughs> there is some kind of confirmation, but that would sort of most plausible scenario. Um, this is this boat as you can see here. So this is another sort of picture from the damage. Uh, so you can see that uh, one section, second section, and then like third section somewhat damaged. Uh, the railroad here, uh, the railroad bridge uh, probably suffered uh, structural damage from the high heat, from the fire, from this railroad carriages, but we'll find out later. Uh, the whole point of all of this is and why this is important uh, is this railroad line, as you can see, it goes through here, carriage, and then it goes, it supplies all Russian troops here on Kherson Bridgehead. There's another line that goes, as you can see here. However, this line, um, you know, it goes close to Donetsk, kind of like south of Donetsk, and then goes to south. Um, southeast and there's that station that um, I mentioned called uh, Ilovaisk. It's it's a large railroad uh, juncture, but it's not only railroad juncture. It's also large 
um, depot for locom uh, locom uh, locomotives. Um, and basically, it's, it's big infrastructure, railroad infrastructure center in probably one of the largest uh, in that region. So, <coughs> as you can see, the attacks are being sort of clearly focused on um, uh, disrupting Russian supplies in this sort of in the south of Ukraine, right? Even Russian sources they openly admit that this uh, created additional disruption to the supply of the Russian troops uh, in the Kherson uh, area, even though they trying to quickly renew the whole thing and they're using ferries too, but it's still, as I said, not the same volume. So uh, that kind of tells us that uh, there will be something, you know, major offensive down the road. Uh, don't know how quickly it could be, you know, tomorrow could be in two days. But given that this disruption happened, it is relatively short, it creates short window, right, of additional disruption to the Russian ammunition supplies, which are already kind of under strain here in on Kherson bridgehead. So that creates a relatively short window of opportunity uh, for Ukrainian side to take advantage of. So judging from that, that that this then this offensive should be happening within you know day two three four five uh otherwise that opportunity window of opportunity will be gone essentially so this is kind of like you know a little bit about this whole logistical situation and sort of the railroad war basically of supply uh logistical war uh now let's actually look let's look what's going on uh, in the russian military command uh, so, <coughs> in light of all of these setbacks, uh, Russian president changed the commander of the all of the Russian troops in Ukraine. Now, this is the the new commander is this person Sergei Serovikin. He used to command um, troops uh, near Lysychansk. So, if, so, if those who followed um, uh, the channel uh, was, I think, in uh, July. Uh, that Russian troops managed to actually suddenly breach Ukrainian defenses kind of like south and southeast of Lysychansk and then exploit that um, and basically force Ukrainian troops, created like an almost encirclement and essentially forced Ukrainian troops without much fight out of Lysychansk and uh, all the way to like Bilohorivka and uh, basically, the front line move almost to Siversk. So that was uh, actually credited the, to this person. So that was his so-called biggest achievement uh, during the war so far. Uh, prior to that, uh, he served in uh, Syria two times. Um, he served most of uh, 2017 in Syria and then also again in 2019. So he was uh, credited in 2017 with sort of military success that allowed uh, Russia and uh, its allies, uh, including uh, Iran, uh, to basically re uh, regain control of almost all of the Syria. So uh, again, so he was, um, and he was awarded um, like Hero of Russia, I think, the award for this. Uh, for that success. The, the war in Syria is totally sort of different and the experience there is pretty much irrelevant to what's going on in Ukraine. Nevertheless, uh, he's apparently seen as someone who is capable and actually if we go back to his uh, prior history, we actually can see there is something to it. And um, But let's just actually, so he start, let's go all the way back how he started his career. So he started his career in the Soviet army in 1983. Uh, then he actually become, well, not famous, but or I guess negatively famous in 1991, in August of 1991, there was a coup attempt by the Soviet military in August, um, I think it was uh, August 19 or something or 18 something along plus minus two two days uh, in the Soviet Union 
that failed after two or three days because most of the military didn't follow uh, the directions of this uh, members of the coup. It was, it was called the HKCP. Uh, however, uh, he was uh, uh, Sergei Serovikin was actually captain at that time, and he actually did follow uh, the orders. Uh, he brought in, uh, like I think, fifteen or ten or twenty. Uh, um, infantry fighting vehicles to Moscow to the streets of Moscow, and uh, actually, and he actually started engaged in kind of like fighting with the civilians who were protesting at the time. As a result of that, uh, three of them died. <coughs> I think one of the IFE got burned by the civilians as well. So basically, he was, uh, you know, very, let's say. Uh, following the orders, uh, even, you know, it was clear that was totally, like, definitely no mass support in, for for that, uh, for those members of the coup. Uh, so he was in jail for seven months after that because, you know, coup failed, which is interesting because then a new Russia president, Yeltsin, actually uh, freed him uh, from the jail and actually uh, promoted him to a major. Um, apparently, he needed people like that, which is very interesting because that president actually uh, got power as a result of the failure of that coup. So it was because uh, the Soviet Union then dissolved on December 1991, and you know then the then Yeltsin, who was actually also protesting. Uh, in, by participating in that all, all of the activities against the coup um, uh, which is again so as I said he a gave, gained the power full power of the uh, of the Russia after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and also participating on the other side of this coup uh, nevertheless he promoted him to a major so he was uh, then he went to uh, uh, to get a uh, high level military education, uh, was caught there that he was selling uh, weapons basically to, I don't know, whoever he was selling them, illegally obviously. Uh, so he was sentenced uh, uh, to a year in, in prison. He did not serve it, it was just conditional. Uh, and so um, basically that's, that was uh, so he's uh, at the same time he graduated with honors um, from that uh, from that military school. Um, so you can see he's kind of like he's not sort of dumb. He's intelligent, but then he there is this uh, there's some kind of level of uh, cruelty, I guess. Maybe that's probably the right way to describe it uh, in uh, in him. And then there was, an, and so then he actually, you know, he, you know, climb was climbing up the ladders. Uh, he was commander of uh, 42nd Infantry Division, which is on the front line in Ukraine right now. And there was a, um, a couple accidents there while he was there. Uh, in one in instance, uh, the sort of. I don't know how you call it, how to translate it, but basically uh, one of the person who is responsible for um, arms in the division, so he kind of like um, oversees all, the ar all of the arms, they had some kind of conversation with him, and after that conversation he shot, you know, he killed himself, uh, which was very strange and unusual, and uh, there was allegation that was result of this conversation with him, um, if, if, if it was, uh, you know, uh, murder, nobody knows. So, <coughs> again, it was also very interesting because it was related to uh, someone who was supervising arms in the unit, all of the, he was in charge of all of the um, weapons uh, in the unit. So, uh, and going back to his illegal sales of the weapons during his uh, education, uh, military education period, uh, and the rest, uh, the rest is kind of like I guess uh, you already know. He was just climbing up, and then eventually, you know, 
he served in Syria and then now he's promoted. He is in charge of the whole uh, Russian forces uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, so there are, it looks like there are more, uh, so there is more reshuffling uh, in the Russian uh, high military command. Uh, their um, head of the force a mechanized division was also dismissed, which is one of the um, elite units, but it has proven anything but elite units. Yeah, it was a complete failure with uh, very little fighting spirit. Uh, and probably because of that, he was also dismissed because the expectation was that that, that unit will have high fighting spirit and it actually turned out anything but, but, but that. So that's um, that's all uh, for now for sort of general kind of like information and updates. Let's actually move to the front line. Oh, let me actually show uh, actually where that Ilovaisk is. Uh, I think I didn't show. So this is this juncture here. Ilovaisk is here basically. So as you can see, this this branch goes there. And it goes through Ilovaisk essentially because here the front line. So this is the main kind of juncture and infrastructure point that uses where the all of the locomotives are and all of that to basically haul all of the um, um, carriages uh, on this line essentially. And then this has been somewhat damaged, so we'll see what what sort of happens here. Uh, so. <coughs> Now let's look what's going on on the uh, on the uh, battlefield. Uh, the first uh, will start in a clockwise fashion, starting from very north, as we always do. Uh, the situation uh, along the state border got a little bit more heated. There are more exchanges of artillery fire. Um, just uh, kind of informing uh, about the general situation there. Now let's jump to uh, this North Luhansk. Uh, front line. Uh, it's very interesting right now that a there is not much moon, movement of Ukra by Ukrainian troops and not even um, major attacks or anything. Uh, they essentially on pause. I, 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 it's very hard to sort of explain what's going on there. At the same time, uh, Russian uh, troops are sort of not waiting and uh, they are counter attacking actually. So they counterattack from this uh, from this Kremina area uh, towards this village Dubro, and they even claimed that they managed to capture this village. And there was another attack that sort of directed towards this village Terni. So as you can see, <coughs> Russian command and troops completely sort of uh, regain control of this, uh, themselves because before uh, it was. Uh, borderline disorderly uh, retreat, panic, and now they uh, totally regained and they sort of prepared to fight. And that's uh, why I said this is uh, absolutely a big mistake not to pursue and not to Russian troops and not to put pressure. Even if Ukrainian troops are exhausted and so on, uh, the, the, the problems down the road by not pursuing are far outweigh you know potential sort of additional losses or anything that can uh, or risks that can, that come out of pursuing uh, russian troops right away so there are also rumors that russian troops are bringing more reinforcements here and so on so uh, it's possible that ukrainian um command sort of lost opportunity and uh, Russian defenses, defensive line will be established for now, the way you you see it, uh, and this will be for some time some defensive line. We'll see what happens. Uh, for sure, Ukrainian sort of side will try to uh, continue pushing uh, Russian uh, occupational troops out of Ukraine. Um, but it's definitely going to be harder and B, it's probably going to cost more lives of Ukrainian soldiers because um, breaking through established defenses obviously will cost many more lives as opposed to when uh, Russian troops are not dug in. Um, but uh, as you can see, they regained control and they started counter-attacking and we can even, let's move um, 
south let's see what's going on north Donbass front line we can see even more of that so <coughs> you can see pretty much everywhere especially this Wagner mercenaries they aggressively attacking every in pretty much every single spot even like here the more sort of northern part of it even here Belohorivka so essentially they there is very aggressive sort of uh, attacks so you can see here everywhere uh, basically throughout all of this uh, front line they aggressively pushing forward uh, now let's move to um, central Donbass front line uh, here as well was kind of call it a busy day with uh, uh, Russian troops aggressively attacking. They attacking here, north um, east of Avdiivka, then out of this Piski salient here, a little bit south of Marienka, no, no Mikhaika. So basically, as you can see, uh, they 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 pretty aggressively pushing sort of forward. By the way, this is the Silovaisk, just so uh, you understand where this. And the, the railroad line kind of like goes very close to the kind of goes to Alenivka and then goes kind of like this. So it's very close to the front line. <coughs> so that's why that uh, Crimean bridge is very important because technically it used to be very sort of like in a like far rear of the Russian troops, almost kind of like virtually guaranteed supply. Uh, of uh, material and uh, weapons, everything, ammunition, and uh, because this one is, you know, as you can see, it could be relatively easy intercepted. By the way, this is that uh, 42nd division that uh, Surovikin was in charge of. Um, now let's um, let's see what's going on on the Parisia front line. Things here are quite the same. No major changes here. Uh, as pretty much forever. Uh, now let's move to Kherson bridgehead. Let's see what's going on there. <clears throat> so here Ukrainian troops also like continuing putting pressure against the newly established uh, Russian front line, but uh, there is no, uh, first of all, it's not like strong pressure. It looks like it's more like a probing attacks uh, than anything. It's not like major attack at this point. Um, but at the same time, Russian troops are not retreating as easily as before. Again, the same kind of situation, similar to what's going on in Novo Luhansk, uh, sorry, not Lovo, North Luhansk um, uh, front line, where Russian command, Russian troops regained control of themselves. They stopped panicking, they stopped, like, you know, uh, being afraid, like, oh, we lost, everything is lost, uh, and so on. The, the sort of attitude is, has clearly changed uh, for how long it will last will, will, will remains to be seen uh, but what is very clear is that Ukrainian command Ukrainian troops lost momentum that is 100% uh, true uh, the sort of <coughs> everything is still on the side of Ukrainian uh, troops especially here on Kherson bridgehead, as we discussed, uh, Russian troops are uh, starved for uh, artillery ammunition and generally uh, starved for ammunition here. So it's uh, not easy for them. So again, this will be lost. It's just a question of time. It looked like uh, it was on the verge of uh, being lost uh, within a week. Now it looks like it may last uh, another months maybe months and a half maybe could even like best case scenario for russian side is two months or let's say if russia launches major offensive somewhere else this you know technically in, there is a small chance that this uh this situation will remain the way it is for for some time so again um the situation is has stabilized uh, for the Russian side, for how long remains to be seen. Uh, it's very clear that Ukrainian command will continue putting pressure and that's a big goal uh, for Ukrainian side to basically liberate this whole bridgehead and uh, regain control of Kherson. That would be, that's not only sort of military victory, but it's a psychological victory, first of all. 
uh, internally for uh, Ukrainian society. It's extremely important um, because uh, the society has invested heavily in terms of human lives. Uh, and then obviously there is expectation to see some results out of it. Um, so, and the pressure to show results is mounting um, politically in Ukraine, obviously. Also, obviously, like uh, from international politics, it also matters uh, just to prove that uh, this whole support was worthwhile uh, from the, you know, for, for the West. Uh, but again, the internal is the most important because in the end, that's who fights. It's not the, uh, you know, best who fights, but it's actually Ukrainian citizens who go and fight and die there on the front line. Uh, thanks for watching and until tomorrow. Bye bye.